Welcome to another MBS Highway Live Monthly Webinar. I'm one of your hosts, Megan Anderson, along with Barry Habib. And today's special guest, he's a visionary thinker, public speaker. Okay. You've probably you read his no, newsletter. Volume. We, got, we got you, John. We got we you. Got him, we got him. We got him. Yes, We're live, John. You're all good. We are live. Okay. And as I was telling you guys, we have the wonderful, amazing John Malden with us. You've probably read his newsletter, Thoughts from the Frontline. He's a New York Times bestselling author. He's the chairman of Malden Economics, where he hosts an annual gathering of some of the most brilliant minds in the world. In fact, our very own Barry Habib is going to grace the stages at the Strategic Investment Conference, which is happening in early May. So John, thank you for taking time with us today. Everyone join me in welcoming the brilliant John Malden. Well, let's get me situated here. The, the brilliant John Malden is running late. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's all right. Which, we'll, we'll, which we'll, we're, which we're will know is not unusual. Uh, we're 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 good, John. We're I am just brightly started. dressed. I've got all of my flashy clothes on here, so have, have to try to keep up with uh, uh, keep up with Barry. Oh, you you look very dapper, my friend. It's uh, it's it's great to have you join us here today. We're excited about it, and uh, and and I I know that we were discussing you and I just yesterday some of the things that are going on. There is so much going on, John. You know, we could take so many topics because. Your tentacles extend with uh, so many contacts. It's pretty amazing. So I think everybody's, everybody's interested in so many things here today, John. Um, I don't even know where to begin because there is so much. Let me just ask you, is there anything pressing, first of all, on your mind? Because I've got a lot that I can ask you um, well, your take on. You and I were talking. I mean, I'm always about energy uh, uh, lately uh, because that's kind of been a focus. But, you know, you're, you still have to worry not have to worry, but you have to think about what the Fed's going to do, what's the response going to be um, from governments, uh, elections. Uh, you, I mean, it's the gamut of everything you and I talk about when we're sitting at dinner somewhere. So let's talk real quick about energy, since you're, you mentioned that first. So oil prices, they, they've peaked back above 80%. $2, let's just say $83 are in that range. Now, if we, if you go by West Texas intermediate, you know, they were down at 65. We're supposed to be filling the strategic petrol petroleum reserve when it was under 70. It looks like we may have missed that window. It's not an easy thing to fill the strategic petroleum reserve, but why is in our government, at least locking in future prices at these levels? Because if you feel, if you feel, and I feel this way, that it seems that energy prices are more than likely going to head higher. Um, what are your thoughts on the direction of energy prices and why haven't we, in your humble opinion, tried to fill or refill that strategic petroleum reserve? It's been drained quite a bit, John. Well, we, we did take it down. And I think most people agree that they hit the SPR for political purposes to try to keep the price of oil down per, prior to the election, saying that they would fill it back up at 70. We got to 70. They didn't want to see the oil price spike, so they didn't do it. Um, and basically, Saudi and the rest of OPEC have said, okay, you told us to sit still while you were bringing, you know, while you were utilizing your strategic petroleum reserves, and we sat on our hands. And you told us you'd fill it back at, you know, 70. And you didn't, so... We're going to take that option away from you now. You clearly didn't do what you told us you would do. And from their self-interested perspective, which if I was sitting on a pile of oil outside the U.S., um, I would have the same perspective. Uh, they just said, we're going to cut production. Now, some of that production they're quote-unquote cutting, okay, is really acknowledging uh, their lack of uh, ability to produce. Um, I don't think, I mean, it's debatable, but I don't think Russia cut 500,000 barrels of oil a day. I think their production just is not getting it. They don't have access to Schlumberger, Halliburton, or any of that thing. Their wells, their, their wells are depleting. They don't have the technology they need. Uh, a lot of uh, expats were driving it. They've left a lot of the Russian technology 
uh, experts that were needed have left, not to mention just young guys. I mean, they're losing hundreds of thousands, and as I've now seen estimates close to a million people, productive workers, have walked out. Uh, so, you know, it's going to be tough for them, um, especially if you're a young man when they're drafting anything that can walk, um, or young being under 50. Um, the incentive to go, and that just makes it more difficult for Russia to increase their production. Uh, Macron whispered in Biden's ear about six months ago that uh, Saudi and Emirates don't have any uh, production capacity they could use to bring the price down because Biden was wanting them to increase their production to bring the price of oil down. And Macron just said, that's not going to happen. They don't have the capacity. And Macron didn't give away any state secrets. We all, we, all of us already knew that. I mean, that was, that was a, a, a evident except Biden. Um, and some of the people in his administration hoping, I don't know what they were hoping for. So where do you see oil prices going from here? I mean, I know that when we look at the futures, we're in backwardation, meaning that future prices, if you go out each month, prices, for those of you unfamiliar with the term, it means that prices are actually lower, but that's a contrarian way. It's, it, it, it's counterintuitive. When you see future prices going lower, that means there's more uh, there's more storage space available, which means there is a little bit less oil. That actually suggests price increases as we move forward. Do you see prices of oil increasing, John? And do you think we'll touch triple digits, let's just say later this year or next year? Barring a global recession, or even a, what I don't think will be a deep recession in the U.S., and this is something you and I can talk about, but barring a, a real global recession, I, I think we see triple digits in oil. Um, if we have a global recession, prices will go down um, and give us a, a buying opportunity because I think demand will, as it is every time in the past for the last 60, 80 years, demand will increase. Let me turn my phone off, guys. And, and John, we were going to talk about this. So we're just jumping from one thing to another because so much we want to talk to you about. So let, let's talk for a minute about um, digital currency. And I know that this is something you're going to bring out at the Strategic Investment Conference. You know, the, the, the plan in the U.S. for, for a, a digital currency. Do you think that it will be um, something to fear? Is it disruptive? I'm not talking Bitcoin here. I'm talking about a government-sponsored digital currency. I don't currency. think we'll have a true digital currency in the sense of Bitcoin. Will we, will we be able to um, do what you and I do now? I mean, uh, well, with Megan, with the exception of, of, uh, of Barry, not everybody's carrying around $10,000 in their pocket when they walk into the store in cash. The, the rest of us just pull out our, our credit cards and um, not true, uh, by the way. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> the, the, um, um, I mean, so I do have some cash because I live in Puerto Rico, but it's in a drawer in a safe, um, a hidden drawer in a hidden safe, by the way, for all of you people that are, you know, are watching. <laughs> but the, the um, uh, it's there because Puerto Rico presents a unique set of emergencies. But frankly, if you're living in uh, any hurricane zone, if you live in any uh, tornado alley, there's there's just, if you can do it, if you can afford it, it's always good to have a little cash there. But other than that, digital currencies are not unlike what we're using now. Powell said that we'll have a central bank Currents, digital currency over his dead body. Uh, and I think he's talking about, you know, a Bitcoin. Frankly, I find the prospect troubling to the extent that central banks, the Treasury Department, will be able to see what you're spending money on and say, you know, I, I mean, I, I don't think that in the U.S. we'll go the way of China with, you know, social um, point credit points and 
you know, tracking everything. Uh, I, I can't imagine, frankly, that happening in a country with a few conservative states like Texas and some others saying, sure, please, sur please surveil everything that we're doing and, and, and make sure that yeah. we're on the approved list to buy the right type of vegetables. Yeah, that's that. That's that's I, I, yeah. Powell said that uh, over my dead body. Yeah, but you know that's where I was going, John. Is that a you know with the Big Brother or the you know the 1984 you know George Orwell version of uh, digital currency that has a lot of people. I mean, you speak to a lot of people that um, have that as a fear. You know that that's that's kind of the way we're going. So you you don't you don't see that as something that will be. Um, it's hard for me to imagine. Of course, the the title of my conference this year is Thinking the Unthinkable. But thinking that we will have a currency that will allow a government to control and see what you spend and then start great, you know, doing what China's doing, that's awful hard for me to think about. Got it. Okay. Just, so, John, let's, let's I just, just I just think too much of my fellow Texans and some other Southerners are here and there that would then just say, not no, but hell no. <laughs> okay. You know? All right. Well, that's a good thing, because um, I don't think a digital thing. currency with surveillance is necessarily something that we'd want. But, um, John, staying a little bit on the political theme here, I know, again, again, you have just such great insights, and, and you speak to some people with great insights. You know, here we are in 2023, and a year from now, it's all going to be, you know, election talk, as we already come into another election cycle. Um, you, you believe that the on the Democrat side, you think it's going to be Biden once again. And on the Republican side, what are your sources telling you a likely candidate would emerge to be? My sources are as confused as hell. Uh, prob probably some of your best sources too, Barry. I mean, um, the, the, there is a significant, as in, a clear majority of the country would prefer for, for Trump to not run, even Republicans. That being said, if he runs because it's a primary, it's not a general, he could win a general. Um, there's a, I mean, what, what is it they say, you know, a, a week is, is, is a few years in politics? Well, a year is a century in politics. Uh, lots of things can change. Um, I mean, Saturday night, um, I will be in Austin listening to uh, uh, DeSantis speak. Uh, I'm sure you've heard him many times, Barry, but I've never actually had the privilege of either meeting or uh, hearing him speak. Um, during the 2016 cycle, I met with a majority, you know, you had those 10, 12 people on stage. I met with the majority of those people, uh, not Trump at all, uh, when they were running uh, at one time or another. I would like to do that again this cycle. That being, all that being said, for somebody to say they want to take on Trump, is a big step. I think I think there will be. Um, Trump just sucks the air out of the room. He's got such an advantage in terms of media, unpaid media. Um, and all the other media will be putting him and putting anybody else that's running in in that context. So I, right now we can't know. Biden's acting like he wants to run. He's getting on up to an age that's not that far, I'm not that far away. Um, I, All right, and, and John, it, I just want to just want to comment on I one thing at, here. I mean, so. I'm ashamed. We got to stand. I'm a conservative, so I look at the Democrat bench and I just see it as weak. Uh, Gavin Newsom doesn't make my heart go pity pat. Um, I mean, Bernie Sanders is too old. Um, I, I don't know who they run. Uh, if without Trump, we would have a rocking, rolling primary for Republicans because 
everybody, just like 2012 and 2016, will think they can see a path, they can win this thing. Uh, but Trump is going to uh, limit the field somewhat. And, and I, just, I just want to make some comments, John, just because I'm, I'm noticing the chat. So, so team, listen, first of all, just keep it civil, okay? I know that everybody has very passionate views on politics. The reason we talk politics is because they affect economics. So well, just I mean, remember it, that, right? right? That's, that's, why we, that's why we want to try and understand because it, it has something to do with the way you position your business, where rates go, how the economy... So, so just understand that that's the... That's the discussion we're having here. So let's just keep it where everybody just kind of just, just. Simple, but, but, but the, the, um, the Republican presidential candidate will, um, you know, immediately open pipelines. Uh, they'll, they'll increase drilling potential. Uh, they'll reduce regulations, not unlike what we were seeing under Trump. Um, it, that will have an effect on oil prices in 2026. It's hard to affect something. It's hard to make a few regulatory changes and have that make a lot of difference within nine months to a year. Uh, the big oil companies are, are not producing that much. I mean, today we're watching Exxon discussing uh, a buyout of Pioneer. And the only reason Exxon wants Pioneer is because they have not just a lot of proven, you know, and, and barrels in the ground, they have the last large, as in very large, um, fields in, um, and drilling sites in the Permian, which is producing 50% of our oil. Can I ask uh, a question we, about oil? Huh? You, uh, you know, you mentioned oil and how, you know, how all of this can affect oil prices in 2026. But, you know, we had just talked about oil previously and how you see oil kind of going up a little bit from, you know, this point forward in the next previous reports. And I'm curious your thoughts on, you know, as oil prices go up, that's obviously going to affect inflation. How do you think that's going to affect well, it, it, the it, Fed? It, uh, I think energy is what, uh, Barry, you can tell me 7% of CPI? Yes. So yes. if oil goes not, up- not, nine, 9% of core. Yes. 9% of core. So yeah, because it filters through. 20% or $100. Uh, that's going to take energy up a half point. I mean, um, inflation up a half point. Is that about right, Barry? Am I figuring that yeah. out? Yeah. I'm doing this in my head, so it could be wrong. Uh, so it will increase inflation, but we have to remember we measure inflation in two ways, month over month and year over year. I, I don't know that it's going to have that much effect long term, year over year. Uh, oil companies aren't drilling more than replacement. The, well, I think it's something like two thirds of the rigs in the United States today are private operations. They're companies like the one I'm involved with. We're just drilling for... Uh, uh, to improve a field and hoping to flip it to a to a to a larger group who will then prove it up some more and either finish it out or sell it to an even larger group. It's 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 all about the food chain. So John, because because we know that you know inflation is such a big part right. of 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 the industry we're in because it it affects everything you know from you know obviously mortgage rates because mortgage rates are going to follow inflation. But even the way that individuals have disposable income, which allows them to have more affordability to purchase homes. So there's so many aspects of how inflation touches us, which is why, you know, exploring the, the political side of it and then the policies that can determine, you know, what happens with, with you know, oil prices. So that's why I'm, I'm interested in the strategic petroleum reserve, because, John, I think it's about 400 million barrels that we had drawn yes. down. So are we going to, for the safety of the country, if you deem, if you think that it's important to have that safety net, going to replace it? And then what actually happens to oil prices if we do refill the strategic petroleum reserve? Does it cause prices to rise dramatically? It would cause to prices to rise, but Barry, I'm willing to put a substantial offer. I'll pick up your dinner and bar tab against you picking up mine, which you'd probably do anyway. I will take the under 
on uh, any oil being put into the Strategic Petroleum Reserve <coughs> until after the next election. Um, I mean, that may be the gift that Biden gives to the next guy. I don't know. Or if he if he wins, then <coughs> I, I I don't think they see it as all that big an imperative. If if it was an imperative, they would have been refilling it back at sixty two. I mean, sixty five, sixty seven. They would have been locking in futures. Um, clearly, it's not. So they just don't see it as a problem. All right. So. Given that, but, but, coming, okay. but going back to your point about inflation, inflation is important because that's what's going to drive interest rates. And my view is that we get in the May meeting, which will be in the middle of SIC, uh, they're going to raise 25 bips between uh, that May meeting and the June meeting. They will get two CPI reports and two unemployment reports. And what they do in June, I think, will be highly dependent on those reports. I could see a set of dates some data coming in that says we're going to raise another 25 bips. I could see a, a set of data coming in saying they're not going to raise it at all. But I think whatever they do, it's going to stay high for longer. They are not going to be, I mean, I know the market is trying to plan in a cut, but I would make you a, another bet is that we do not see a, 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 a interest rate cut this year. It would have to be a, you know, pretty much a go to hell scenario for them to do that. I, I was writing a year ago, I thought they'd get to 5% Fed's fund and 5% unemployment before they felt they needed to do something. I wrote this last week. I think it's four and a half points of unemployment. Maybe, you know, I mean, we're three, five, three, seven, something like that. It keeps, I mean, it's historically low unemployment and it hasn't risen. And the, the I don't know that the Fed, when they look at their mandates, feels the need to cut rates when unemployment's going to be under four and a half. But the thing of it is, is that um, that we all know that unemployment is a terribly lagging indicator, right? I mean, that's a it's a very, very lagging indicator. And we know a couple of things, right? So we know that the engine of job growth has been leisure and hospitality. That's almost come back from the eight and a half million job losses. We've almost put them all back and forward looking. We know the job postings in that sector has really come down. So that engine of job growth seems to be running out of gas. We also know that hours worked is now declining. So that's another leading indicator. What, 1%? Well, actually less than that, John. It's 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 one-tenth and one-tenth. But the thing of it is, is that- <laughs> So, even I though, mean, hours worked is a, is a leading indicator. Correct. But it's, it's not as indicative as other things. I mean, we're we're watching temporary unemployment uh, is uh, going down. I mean, that's a good indicator. Jobs are going to become more difficult, but you've still got twice as many jobs as you've got people looking for uh, uh, work, jobs, or, or roughly. But remember that a lot of those are overstated due to the nature of work from home. So you're going to post multiple job offerings. And we've always had more openings. And there's a mismatch in the type of people that are being hired. The type of paying jobs that are being hired have been more on the lower scale. But as I said, I think that those leisure and hospitality jobs have pretty much all come back. So listen, we'll 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 see on that. We'll we'll that's going to be a dinner bet for us, John. But I I think um I think your thoughts are very well taken that even if there is going to be some job losses, it might not be as severe. And, and which reduces the Fed's um, perceived need to uh, uh, cut rates. The, I don't think under the current worldview, that they're worried about market prices. 
Now, if, if, if inflation was one to one and a half percent, one and a half percent like it was the last time they started, you know, they started a tightening cycle in 2018 and then, then dialed it back uh, because inflation was low and, you know, Powell was looking at the market and, you know, honestly, he wanted to be reappointed. So, but John, we're going to be getting, we're going to be getting, we just started bank earnings. And I think next week, some of those regional bank earnings will come out. Now, while the Fed may not see that, I think that the Fed is under a couple of misconceptions, potentially, let's put it that way. So I think that the Fed has this 2% inflation target. But if you look at the Fed's mandate, it's actually not a 2% inflation target, it's price stability. So, right. you know, remember, 4% was good enough for Volcker, right? So um, is is two and a half or 3% that terrible? Because what the Fed seems to be doing is the opposite of price stability. When you raise 500 basis points in a year and 375 in five months, when you do something like that, that doesn't create price stability, it creates instability and the way that they kept rates too low. So I, I think that they're, they're, they look in the rearview mirror, they are, in my opinion, causing things to break right now. Now, whether or not the job market breaks, it's still going to be important if the banking system contracts to a level where the economy starts to really struggle, even if we don't see your typical recession where you have a ton of job losses, right? I, I, I agree. And, but, but that being said, I think the, I think most it seems to be when we're listening to most of the FOMC speakers out that they're concerned about inflation. And you well know, Barry, that 3% inflation, which doesn't sound like that much more than two, but 2% 2 inflation means you lose half your buying power in 36 years. 3% is 24 years. I certainly hope I'm here in 24 years. I'm 73, so that'll get me about to the age of my mother. But I don't particularly want to lose half my buying power after I've worked like, you know, heck for now 50 years to be able to retire. I would like to be able to retire in a circumstance that uh, Shane would enjoy it. Uh, John, doesn't that also just look at one side of the equation? Because then wouldn't prices of your other assets potentially rise at a greater rate if inflation were slightly higher? I mean, wouldn't that mitigate the damage to some extent? Or perhaps give you an advantage it, it, it to something. Mitigates extent. it, but honestly, lately, Barry, where are you getting um, real returns lately? Well, real returns that's available, lately. That's available to 95% of our fellow Americans. Well, that's been a long time since we've had, had the ability to get real returns, right? Because even when inflation was very low, the real return was negative because you couldn't get anything. I mean, at least right now, you get a small real return. Agreed. But I'm, I'm just talking, if we're talking at a 3% hurdle to get to break even, um, and we're two and a half points from that 3% inflation number, so we, it's got to come down some. But John, that's my argument. I think it's already it, it, there. It, it, it's already it's it's already there. John, this is analogous to the Fed. If they were to take a shower in the morning, they put their hand under the water and it's ice cold. So rather than set it somewhere in the middle that's reasonable, they've they've decided to set it to extreme hot. And then they crank it all the way and they put their hand under until they burn themselves, which they've done. And then they got to go to extreme cold rather than set and be patient. So my argument here, well, John, okay. they've already Barry, killed inflation. Barry, I'm going to push back. Okay. I we love had that. this conversation six to nine months ago, I believe in Palm Beach. Uh, your memory is better than mine. But we were both agreeing that the Fed was right in raising rates and fighting inflation. Yes. You have gotten to the point where you said, okay, we fought inflation enough. We've won the war. Let's, let's, let's have a strategic a retreat or at least a truce. Um, if we were talking 6% Fed funds rate, I'd be on your side of the table. Uh, five and a quarter, after I see those two reports, I may say, yeah, time to, time to, uh, time to back it off. But if, if we're talking five and a quarter, we get to June, and 
Inflation is still at four and a half. Uh, you're better at predicting these things than I have because you and Megan actually sit there and work the spreadsheets. Um, but is it unreasonable to think that we'll be over 4% in June when they have that meeting on the 12th? Well, I think it depends on what you're looking at. We know that um, we know that we're going to start to see some of the benefit that we get from here. You know, just just to, to give you a couple of quick a couple of quick screenshots here because it's just easier to do it this way. So I'm going to I'm going to pick a couple of things here, John, just to kind of illustrate them to you. So when you take a look here, this is the shelter yes. component of CPI, 43.2 percent. But this is the way it's being reported, and there's a mathematical calculation that you could do right here. So the difference between the two is five and a half percent. 43.2 percent of this number means that there is a, a an overstatement of 2.4 percent in CPI. In other words, waiting for that water to go from all the way cold to the middle of the road rather than extreme hot, that you're going to see 3.2% inflation on core CPI if you just waited. Now, that's not 2%, but it usually is a little bit higher on the CPI than it would be in PCE. This should translate to about 2.5% on PCE. So what my, our, my, my point is, is that I think that most of the heavy lifting is done. We're there. And there could be a propensity to to overstate it, and and this is important because a lot of people. And I are... agree, and to the extent that OER, I mean, I I've had this frustration. I've been actually writing about housing, inflation, and OER now for twenty years, arguing that the way we figure OER is such a lagging indicator. If we had had a real time analysis, much closer to real time. Greenspan would have been raising rates sooner in the aughts. And, you know, and then, you know, without uh, Barney Frank and others cheerleading uh, subprime, uh, we wouldn't have had to have that, uh, um, what ended up becoming a debacle because OER, rate, OER was not showing up in the uh, inflation number. So Greenspan couldn't hear, look, see this inflation number? I've got to raise rates. He, di he didn't have that. And now we're at the point, I mean, going back to your chart, when inflation was showing low and the Fed wasn't doing anything, even though housing prices and OER and costs were dramatically rising, when so they, sh which is what I was talking about in in uh, early uh, 2021, is we have to start raising rates now. We have to get in, get ahead of the game. The, the Fed waited till they were behind the eight ball and then said, "Okay, let's see what we can do. What kind of trick shot do we have?" Well, they're kind of a one trick pony. Uh, they can, you know, well, they have two tricks. They can tighten the money supply or they can raise rates. Um, yeah, so, and I want I want to tie I want to tie a couple of things together because people are talking a little bit. I hear, see it in the chat because this all ties in with uh, with what we see happening with spreads because we see, you know we know where the ten year Treasury is and mortgage rates typically are one hundred and seventy five to two, but the spreads have blown out. One of those is because servicing and the servicing values have gotten sucked out, and that's because the market thinks that rates will come down, so there's going to be a flood of refinancing, so the servicing value will be much less. But there's also another element here, John, and that is safety. So we, we know that in times of, uh, of uncertainty, there's a flight to safety and the 10-year treasury is going to benefit more than things like mortgage-backed securities. But right now, mortgage-backed securities are almost like the redheaded stepchild due to the fact that they may be in a position where some of the ones that are purchased are so underwater, you know, SVB being something like, some, one of the examples of that, that potentially are there other of the other regional banks that have held on to these that now will not have the ability to have the liquidity that are losing deposits that now have to sell mortgage-backed securities. And that's creating a little bit of a greater spread here. I mean, I just want to make sure that we understand the importance yeah. of this. You know, I, Janet I, Yellen's I, basically said to the market, John, she said, well, if you're a small bank or a regional bank, your customers may not be in trouble because if you're not SIFI, you know, a systemically important financial institution, if you're not well, then you don't. You got the two fifty guarantee, and that's it. Two hundred and fifty thousand dollars that you get the FDIC insurance. But after that, I, I'm not I, uh, right. You know, I agree, and I was writing what three weeks ago too. I don't. I remember sometime that we needed to raise the FDIC limits 
Um, we need to, um, uh, at a minimum, create certain types of segmented accounts that, uh, like payroll accounts, even a, even a small business can need to have more than a quarter of a million dollars in a um, payroll a number for a monthly payroll number. Uh, you know, and if the Fed, you know, if it walks in on a, on a Friday before the end of the month, you built your cash up and then they're going to tell you you can't have it. So we need to be covering accounts for payroll. Yeah, but, but John, that's also tough on but, small but banks too. Things- because small banks have to pay for that insurance too, right? That they don't have to pay for now. Well, so- I mean, and, and to get insurance, it's going to cost something. I mean, I don't know if you found an insurance company that's giving you <laughs> free insurance <laughs> for anything, health insurance, life, whatever. It, it, it doesn't... Uh, um, uh, doesn't happen. Um, so that that's going to cost some money. Um, and I, I think it's unrealistic to think that, you know, customers, banks aren't going to do that. Now you can set it up as a tiered thing where your money over two and a half percent, maybe over a quarter of a million dollars, or let's, we take it to a million, um, and we exempt payroll accounts. Uh, maybe after that, then the banks and the customers split it. The banks do whatever. I mean, that that's a market decision that banks and their customers can make, and they'll come up to a uh, to an optimal number that says, "What are we willing to risk?" Small banks are going to be. They're going to be disadvantaged. I mean, it just drives me nuts to say that because they're the you know there's something what forty percent of commercial real estate. Uh, you you know the number better than I do. No, you're you're right on the money, John. You're you're dead I mean, on, it, and I agree it, with that. They, but they're also the ones that have having small businesses. I mean, I used to have small banks um, that they knew my business, and I'd walk in and say, "I need this, this," and that's fine. I mean, I'm now with a top 20 bank. It wasn't a top 20 bank when I put my money there 10 years ago, it is now. Uh, And I haven't seen, physically seen a banker from that bank in 10 years. Yeah, well, but John- They just just don't, I mean, before that, they would come out and see me every other year, but now there's not a personal banker. I mean, there's, and so, but, but in addition to that, though, John, what's also on the other side is it's not just the lending, it's the lending that they've done or the lines that have been extended that they're actually pulling back on. So they're making less of that credit available as well. So, Correct. I mean, th- well, this because is- they, they're, they're all having to tighten up. I mean, I, um, first of all, you talk about, you can't talk about a Fed problem and then bring up SVP in the same sentence. That's just not fair. Okay. SVP, Republic, Signature, the big ones, were management problems. They were regulatory problems. They weren't F- they weren't an FOMC problem, but they were a San Francisco regulatory uh, Fed problem. They let those guys mismatch their duration. And... How many hedge funds, how many private funds, how many banks? I mean, we can just go on and on and on. Clint Murkison, owner of the Dallas Cowboys, one of the nicest human beings you'll want to meet in the 70s and 80s. <clears throat> when the real estate blew out in the 80s, he had to sell the Cowboys and everything else because he his, his duration was mismatched. He was overleveraged and his duration was mismatched. That's happened to so many people. You cannot allow your need for cash and your duration to blow out. All right. And so John, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to shift gears on you here again. And I know you're great. And by the way, John, I love all your insights. It's, it's, it's always amazing. And I think, by the way, John, I think you are probably, if not the, one of the most plugged in people in every aspect of well, what very, is happening, very, whether very it be kind. 
No, it's very true, John. You know, you know, I, he, I, guys, I, guys, what he's working up, he's trying to figure out how to get me to pick up a tab because I'm notoriously <laughs> shorthanded when it comes to a, a, a restaurant check. When Barry's it, in no, the you're you're great, John. You're great. So listen, here's what the point is: is that I want to know what segment are you most excited about because you're so plugged in to healthcare and longevity. You're so plugged into the oil markets politically. So, so give us here, get, we're, we're listening here and we want to know what is an area. And I know you're doing a whole thing at the SIC conference with regards to AI. So I understand that right. as well, but what is it that you're most fascinated about that you see that this, this is an area that we need to really pay attention to maybe as an investment, maybe for our own edification, what is it that you see going forward? Is it maybe something in healthcare? Is well, it something we're, we're going to have about six or seven, in terms of panels, people, so the total participants who are either running venture capital funds or they're being funded by venture capital. I mean, serious technology. Guys that are producing batteries that use silicon, uh, a significant amount more than uh, use, yeah, they still use uh, cobalt and lithium, but they're, they're substituting a lot of silicon. They're increasing the battery storage and decreasing costs. Uh, quantum computing, we'll be talking about um, uh, AI. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, uh, other new tech. Uh, Are you so, talking, so uh, we're, about we're, we're bringing a, a tech guy in from the oil industry saying, here's the new technology in oil. So I'm, I'm always been a big fan of, of new technology. It's, it, it's so you have to be really on top of your game to do that. I will tell you, I'm fascinated by it, but I give my money to people who live and breathe, and that's, you know, 24 hours a day, that's what they're eating, and I let them run it. It's worth a, a point or two points to let other people manage my technology money. I mean, and and, and I'm, I, I think I'm reasonably informed on technology, but man, trying to pick winners and losers is is a real. No, I'm, I'm talking about an overall yeah. sector, like you know, like like the longevity sector. You're you're certainly very longevity sector in. is always going to be biotech. Biotech's still going to continue to be a play. Um, there again, it's you know choosing which biotech you're going to. Um, uh, work on. I mean, you and I have got a, a venture in biotech that we're both um, significantly invested in. Um, the, I, I, I think the biotech world is, is big. Energy is going to be big for a while. I don't know how long. We'll, we'll see. As long as the ESG movement is out there continuing to with whatever their version of woke is these days, <laughs> continuing to uh, suppress um, supply, then, uh, um, you know, it, with demand question. following normal, uh, with demand following normal um, uh, curves, because the rest of the world wants as much energy as the US. The rest of the world being 60% of the world, that's not the US, or Europe. So we're going to, our demand is flat. It goes up a little bit, not much. The rest of the world, the demand is significant. I have a question regarding the SIC conference that I'm really curious about. So love this conference, by the way, everyone, I put a link in the chat box. You can get a 44% discount by clicking that link. Thanks to John and his team. But last year, oh, that's cheaper than I can get. How did you get that? that <laughs> I know, I know. It's so sweet. We feel so special. But no, so last year, one of the major themes of all of these brilliant minds that attended was inflation. And at that point in time, the conversation was, is inflation going to be transitory or is it not? And that was kind of the central theme around the conference. And I'm curious, because I know that you talked to everyone prior to this conference, what do you think is going to be kind of one of the major themes of this conference? Well, we're actually trying to focus on about four areas, uh, Megan. That's a great question. We will be talking on inflation. Um, I've, I've got this this week, I'll have dinner with Lacey Hunt, and I'll be challenging his deflationary view for a while. 
um, the, the, but um, um, we will be talking about inflation and deflation. There'll be a lot of Fed policy. Uh, we've got Bill White, whose view, he's my favorite central banker, but his view is not sanguine. Um, Felix Zuloff will be there. We'll be talking about the same things. We're actually going to have three sessions on political slash social, maybe four if you think about it, um, situations where, I mean, we're bringing in um, uh, Biden's economist, uh, 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 Zandi, Mark Zandi, uh, who's a very good economist. He just, when he twitches, he twitches to the left as opposed to, you know, me, you, Barry, you and I twitch to the right. <laughs> but but uh, he, he's a very good economist. He'll be talking about what he's seeing. Uh, we're going to have uh, the... Uh, David Bonson's interviewing the uh, editor of National Review. It looks like, and this is a first for you, Barry, and, and so I want to put a caveat, they're still trying to work schedules out, but it looks like we're going to be able to get Frank Luntz, which everybody knows, on the same um, um, call with uh, Andy Yang uh, to talk about politics. And then There'll be some of us talking, uh, some people on the, in, in the talking markets, and they'll segue into uh, the whole no labels movement, which is becoming more and more uh, prominent these days as people are starting to try to uh, trash them um, for one reason or another. They don't, they, they don't want anybody else playing in their uh, party. And, the, and then we will be focusing on a lot of technology, as I said. So there's actually, you know, all of those different focuses. We'll how have about how about let's, let's, well, you know, like, you, you'll be doing housing with John Burns? I mean, God, the, the best guy on um, uh, new home construction and the best guy on mortgages at the same table. That'll be fabulous. Um, we've got general economist Liz um, uh, Liz Young. I mean, a lot lots of really good. I'm um, Liz Saunders, rather. Lots of really good people. Uh, Bianca will be there. We're going to have. James, my old, my, old, my old roommate up in Lean's Lodge was Jim Bianco. He's a good man. <laughs> we'll, we'll have, uh, we'll do, a, we'll do a, several, I mean, Friedman will be there. Renee Anino is going to bring in a, a rock star panel uh, on uh, uh, geopolitics. I mean, just people that. But let let, let me let me just to touch to on that, John. I mean, let, let, let me just let me just touch on that well, for that, a that's, second. I mean, that's so Megan. To answer your question, there's not one thing. There's lots of things. Yeah. Go ahead, Peter. So let I me mean, just want to touch on the geopolitic thing because it's it's quite popular. By the way, side note, I was one of the only guys that said inflation was coming in a hard way over this. I said it was going to be a cruel summer back in May. I said, brace yourself. Rates are going to go up way up at your conference. I know a lot of people are a little bit surprised by that, but they did have those those tough months. But anyway. Um, I, I hear a lot of people very concerned about the dollar, about are we going to lose reserve currency status? What's going to happen with China and Russia um, and maybe Brazil, you know, joining forces to create a currency to compete with the dollar? Um, what are your thoughts on that, John? Because a lot of people are, are, have, have mentioned to me that they, they are thinking about this, they're concerned about this. I'll take the other side of that trade and give odds. I mean, the, Russia and China, okay, <clears throat> let's say that the five to 7% of oil that Saudi produces goes to China and they take yuan for it. They're gonna turn right around and spend the yuan back in China, just like we do. If, um, um, I mean, we take our dollars and they turn around and spend their dollars. Uh, I mean, it's it's it, that's not a, a global currency. Uh, if Russia was willing to take, if if oil producers were willing to take any country, then any country in the world would say, yes, we'd rather give you our currency because the dollar is a check on the value of our currency. And if you take our currency directly, which means really that they're going to have to square it up with the dollar, uh, a gold back um, 
uh, currency by the BRICS. Oh, please, I want to get as much of that as possible and then give it to them and say, give me my gold. Just like de Gaulle did with to a Nixon and force Nixon to close the gold window. You cannot, in a modern world, have a gold-backed convertible currency. You can back, you can say you're back in your currency with gold all you want to, but you can't make it convertible. Speaking of gold, sp speaking of gold, John, any thoughts on gold? That's been on a, it's been on a nice move higher. Reached all-time highs recently. You know, you know, I think it was around 2050 or so. It's so come back a little bit. Uh, well, where do you think, where is, do you think this we is, go? This is where I, I make everybody angry. I mean, I've got gold. I bought it in the aughts. I got a good price for it. Um, it's sitting in a vault at a bank, so you, don't, you can't even come to my house for that. And it's gone up in value uh, since the aughts. Um, I hope it goes to zero because that means that everything else in the world work. Gold, to me, is central bank insurance. And while I will sit and tell you that I don't think the Fed will do this and I don't think they will do that, I don't think that something bad is going to happen to me tomorrow, but I still buy insurance. And to me, gold is central bank insurance, and that's all it is. It's not an investment. I have much better places to put my money with longer-term results. I mean, if we really... Do, are going back to our biotech investment, Barry, we both are thinking, and it'll be public, so we can talk here in another month or two months, so we'll be able to tell people about it. Uh, it's been private up to now. But we're both thinking eight to 10 times in the short term from what we bought it at versus long terms of 75 to 100. I mean, so we're not telling you something that, oh, we're already in. We're, we're thinking this is going to work. Do you in your wildest imagination, think that gold in the next 10 years is going to do 2x, 3x? No, no, no. no. I mean, I just, I we just have better opportunities than that. Um, and by the way, if gold does go 10x, 15x, that means everything else we're doing isn't working and we're in trouble. Uh, so, I mean, I, I'm to, tomorrow night, Today's Monday, right? Yeah. So tomorrow night I'm in Dallas and I'm meeting with uh, a bunch of gold bucks and, you know, get names that you recognize. David Tice, uh, Barry Kitt, uh, uh, Trader Vic from the old days. <laughs> you know, you, you remember Trader Vic, uh, Barry? Yes, uh, of course. Uh, 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 Victor Sperando. Um, these are all gold bucks. <clears throat> but I'm, I'm the odd duck at that table every time we're there. Uh, because I, you know, I, I grew, my introduction to the old publishing world, the investment world was through gold bugs. I mean, they were all gold bugs back in the early eighties, late seventies, early eighties. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not. Megan, we got, we got a few minutes here for people. If they want to ask any specific questions of John, let's remember, John's not going to pick individual stocks. If you want to ask John about something, just pop it in the chat. Megan will probably uh, pick it up. People have, me. I mean, I, I have to look down guys to see that number. It's a little small screen. Yeah. Uh, so jo so John's in Puerto Rico. I just to do just their questions. Yeah. Jo John's in Puerto Rico. The, the tax situation there is very favorable in Puerto Rico, along with the weather. <laughs> As we look here through here for questions, one that did come up a few times that I want to ask you about is, you know, we've been talking about technology and AI is really big right now. And I'm curious what your thoughts are on how this is ultimately going to change the world. Do you believe that AI chat GPT can ultimately help bring down inflation by making us more productive? What are kind of the long-term effects of this? AI is, you're too young to remember, Megan. Barry might remember when, um, uh, well, you're, you're 10 years, 15 years younger than I am, Barry. Uh, you might remember when Motorola bought out their, uh, I think it was the 8200, their 32-bit their chip. 
Now we'd had chips for 20 years or before, but they'd all been four bit, eight bit, 16 bit. Motorola finally brought out a 32 bit chip. The current version of chat GPT is a 32 bit chip. We have a long way to go, which is good because the current version of chat GPT is buggy. It gives garbage answers. It's, it's a fun little toy. It can be useful if you recognize it for its limitations. I will tell you the thing that I'm more impressed with, and I've got to sit and spend some time between now and SIC, is the art, artificial intelligence. If you remember about four weeks ago, I had a picture of uh, Jerome Powell, looked like uh, Salvador Dali did it. We literally talked into a telephone for 60, I mean, into a say, I want a picture of Jerome Powell. This, my, this were my instructions. I want a picture of Jerome Powell when he realizes he's raised rates too much in the style of Salvador Dali. 60 seconds later, I had four pictures back. And then I said, well, take this out, do this, and change this. 60 seconds later, here are my changes. I said, okay, let's make it Monet rather than Dali. Um, Powell looks cuddly in a Monet style. Um, <laughs> but I mean, the, the, I had friends who were showing me the stuff they're doing with artificial intelligence and art, that's going to change the entire web design, the entire designer world when somebody like me that can't even draw a straight line can now produce, oh my God, art. And so I've started looking for it now. You can go into science fiction chat rooms, science fiction um, um, Kindle stores. I'm, that's what, that's, I'm, I'm not telling you guys what I read for, for, for a hobby of science fiction. And the artwork they're doing for their covers is nearly all being done by artificial intelligence these days. So, Phenomenal so, hey, hey, stuff that it would have cost hey, hey, John, five people or two thousand dollars back in the day. Now it's 60 seconds. John, people want to know real quick two things. They want to ask you for your mortgage rate predictions, I see. And they also want you what's I'm your not thoughts? Going to predict mortgages with Barry in the room. Not not a good life what a, choice. What about a recession? When are you forecasting the recession? We will have a recession, I believe, when? this year. I don't think it's going to be a deep recession. It's not 2008. It's more like 94. My, that's my guess today. Now, if something blows up somewhere, yeah, that could be a problem. But I, that's, I don't, we don't see that. But then we didn't see uh, COVID coming. There are a lot of things we don't see coming. John, what but do you I think? think that, I think we get a recession. It's brief. We get out of it. We move on. I mean, the thing about recessions is that we always get through them. They're not, they're not permanent fixtures. And what about the effects of, I mean, we've got massive debt now. We've got ma massive debt. How do you think that this kind of plays out with the amount of debt we have? And, and also the Fed's balance sheet is really bloated. What, what do you see as, the, as, as how that plays out, John? This you talked about the great play. reset for a long time. So. I, I have been, and this is where I'm going to make everybody angry. So maybe you want to close it before we get there. Um, I think we run into a debt problem in the latter half of this decade. It's, this is part of that whole fourth turning thing, which will be a big focus at the conference. Neil House coming out with a new book. Everybody should read it. It's the fourth turning is here. Uh, it'll be available in June. But I think we're going to come up against what will eventually become bond vigilante saying 50 trillion is just too much or whatever the number is, 60 trillion. And they start saying we want more and rates rise independent of what the Fed can do. That happened in the 70s. It's happened all over the world. There's nothing to keep it from happening here. So what we're going to have to do in my opinion, is stop running the debt up. There's only two ways you can do that, or some combination of the two. You can either cut 
entitlement spending, not going to happen. Or you can raise income taxes, not going to happen. The only way you can balance the budget, even over a four or five year period, is to uh, bring in a value added tax, which I, which yes, is more taxes, but then you lock in lower income taxes. Any economist, I started to put qualifiers, but any decent economist will tell you that uh, consumption taxes do less damage to an economy than income uh, and production taxes. So let's, let's, you know, and, and frankly, you could do a VAT in the 18 to 20% range, get rid of Social Security. So you, there's no Social Security tax. We're just going to pay it. We're going to recognize an entitlement. And oh, by the way, Barry, you and I should not be getting Social Security. I mean, I, 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 by the way, they, they send it to me. I take it because I put, a, you don't want to know how much I put in. But they, so they, right now they're sending me $50,000 a year, which I find remarkable. They shouldn't be sending that to me. And so they need to means test it. They need to means test, uh, um, um, in, you know, all up and down the entitlement world. Now, is that fair? Maybe, maybe not. But John, will, will they think to, of this? At, at some be... point, we're going to we're going to we're going to gore a lot of oxes. But if you did that, then you could balance the budget, um, and then you just say spending is going to be flat. And we'll let and, and you can actually either begin to pay it down or grow your way out. I mean, if, even if you're only growing nominally three, four percent a year, eventually that brings the percentage down as long as you're not adding to it. And if we stop adding to it, the market will go back to sleep. So ju just to but clarify, we, I just saw somebody and we're ready to, to deal with some pain. It's not okay. But by the way, I just I just saw somebody say no social security. That, he's not saying no, so people get social security. He's saying people that are have have high incomes or still make they should not receive social yeah, if, security. if you're making if you're making if you have a net worth of over five million dollars and you're making over a half million dollars a year you should you know or some some number okay uh yeah, but you but, shouldn't be getting social security but now, also when he I, says no what I'm, what, he says about, no. what I'm saying using the value added text is to replace social security payments you don't get rid of social security it's that six and a half percent that's paid by the employers and six and a half percent by the employees, that goes away. So the employers pay less, employees pay less. Now you're going to have to figure out if you're charging a VAT, those are the lower income scale are going to have, you're going to have to figure out something to, you know, balance the equation because now they're paying a uh, consumption tax. I mean, there's lots of things that have to be done that we would take four hours for us to go into, if we're, which we don't have the chance. So I'm not saying that you take away the social safety net. You absolutely do not. But Barry and I don't need, we're, we should be our own safe, safety nets. Yeah, I agree, John. Well, John, um, you've been just amazing. You know, I can't believe an hour has passed so quickly with you. It always does. Every time I'm with you, my friend, um, I, I love, I love talking with you. I love our are, you know, we, we some things we see the same, some things we don't, but it's amazing. It's just such a pleasure to always have uh, respected points of view. I think it's a good thing that all of us should have, right? Always respected points I, it, of view. It is, and, and I think the viewers probably appreciate the fact that you and I are friends enough that we can, we feel free to say, you know, Barry, you're wrong, or John, you're completely missing. And by the way, Megan, let's answer your question. What are mortgage rates going to be, Barry, in in six months or a year? Uh, we're gonna we're gonna see lower mortgage rates this summer. We're gonna start on May tenth with lower inflation. It's gonna continue over the summer, and I think that we're gonna be mid to lower fives this summer. A lot of cash out refis, a lot of purchase activity, very tight inventory. Prices on real estate go higher, so that's 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 where we see it in a nutshell. There's a lot of reasons for that. Um, that uh, that we'll talk more about as time goes on, but I think that yeah. there's some good news. I, my happening. dad bought a home for five percent uh, uh, mortgage rates in 1966. Uh, I've paid a lot more. My last house, I'm paying six percent here in Puerto Rico now. My last house, I had two and three eighths in Dallas. Uh, miss those days, but but five percent is not going to be a deal killer in the home world after everybody adjusts to it. It's going to take some adjustment. 
because we completely took everything from its anchor, from its moorings, with this zero interest rate bound, insane policy that we had. I agree, John. And by the way, does it, does it, I'm sorry, Megan, there's a term I want everybody to, to look at. And John and I, the way we, we kind of talk, and it's the same, John, we talked to Peter Bogvar, we talked with Lacey, you know, we, we, we agree on a lot, we disagree on a lot, but there's something that we do called the steel man. And the steel man is something that you should do. It's the opposite of what people used to do, which is called a straw man argument. The steel man is where you take the other person's point of view and you look at the best parts of it and you kind of take it from there and then try and internally see maybe that I should look at those best parts of it to understand and, and gain um, gain more Absolutely. information, right? So so I, I wish our political system worked on steel man rather than straw man, but uh, but but uh, just something to think about as we go. John, I love you so much, brother. I can't wait to uh, to be together soon. Thanks Thank everyone you, for tuning in. Very always good to be with you. Thanks, thanks, man. Thanks, man. Be well, everyone. Thank you. Thank Megan, you. Thanks for keeping him straight. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thanks, everybody. See you at the SIC conference in May. Bye.